we've saved the best topics for last. Communication has been touted as the most important skill for an effective leader. Mintzberg studies found that administrators spend 80% of their time in interpersonal communication. And you've likely heard the saying, the only thing constant in education is that it's always changing. The communication process is the exchange of information between a sender and a receiver. The sender develops an idea, codes it into words, and transmits the message through a letter, phone call, computer, or nonverbal cues. The message is received. The receiver accepts or rejects the message depending on the credibility of the sender, the sender's persuasive skills, and perceived accuracy of the message. Next, the receiver uses the message. It can be ignored, stored for later, or used immediately. Feedback completes the communication process. The receiver should give feedback to the sender that the message was received and understood. Nonverbal communication is always occurring. This includes actions as well as lack of action. I will highlight four areas of nonverbal communication. Body movements, use of space, variations in speech, and use of time. Body movements include gestures, facial expressions, eye behavior, touching, and movement of limbs and body. Smiling, eye contact, and leaning in displays warmth, engagement, and interest. An example of how people perceive and use space is that employees of higher status have better offices than do employees of lower status. A superior feels free to walk right in on subordinates, but subordinates are more cautious and ask for permission to make appointments before visiting a superior. Variations in speech, such as voice quality, volume, tempo, pitch, or laughing, may portray emotions and intelligence. Use of time includes being early or late, keeping others waiting, and relationships between time and status. Being late could symbolize carelessness or lack of ambition, yet, if the individual is superior, it may signify their position above subordinates. Communication is key to dispersing and gathering information to reach a school's goals and mission. Communication flow can be downward, upward, horizontal, diagonal, or grapevine. These refer to the direction of the communication within the organization. Downward communication occurs when people at higher organizational levels communicate information to people at lower organizational levels. An example would be a superintendent communicating to principals. This communication occurs easily, but is frequently deficient because communication only goes in one direction. Upward communication involves communicating from lower organizational levels to higher levels. An example would be a principal communicating to a superintendent. While this flow allows for strong feedback, it is also met with reservations about speaking up as information moves up the hierarchy. Horizontal communication occurs between employees at the same hierarchical level. This allows for task coordination and emotional and social support among peers. Diagonal communication occurs when hierarchical levels are skipped. This flow allows for quicker access to data. Grapevine is an employee-developed channel of communication. This is flexible and usually face-to-face, -face, resulting in rapid, accurate, and large quantities of information being dispersed. The pattern and flow of communication that connects senders and receivers are called communication networks. The wheel network holds one individual in the center of the wheel and the others are spokes from the center. Communication only goes to and from the center. For example, the superintendent might be the center of the wheel and may communicate with four principals on each spoke. The principals send and receive information to and from the superintendent, but do not communicate with each other. A chain network is hierarchical and restricts communication to the person above and below an employee. The chain network might consist of the superintendent, principals, teachers. The chain network allows the principal to communicate with the superintendent, 
and the teachers. Teachers might be at the bottom of the chain and could only communicate with the principal. A circle network is similar to the chain network, but encloses the communication by allowing two-way communication for all participants. The star network extends the circle network by allowing all members to communicate freely. The most effective network is situation specific. More complex tasks benefit from a more participatory network. Communication flows and patterns are analyzed as part of a network analysis. Analysts identify clicks and roles of members in the communication structure within an organization. Roles often include that of gatekeeper, liaisons, bridges, and isolates. Gatekeepers control information moving in either direction. This is typically a superintendent within a school district. Liaisons connect two or more cliques, but do not belong to a clique. A bridge is a member of a clique who links it with another clique. An isolate has little contact with others. School administrators are encouraged to establish relationships with gatekeepers, liaisons, and bridges. To be a leader in the 21st century school demands leadership of technology. To be a leader of technology requires a willingness to learn, flexibility, and the capacity to accept change as a constant factor. Adaptability and acceptance of ambiguity are essential because technology changes continuously. There is no menu of technology must do's and must haves. Instead, leaders of technology must be lifelong learners and explorers of the new, the exciting, and the useful in technology. There are barriers that interfere with effective communication. Frames of reference is an individual perspective based on learning, culture, and experiences that influences the communication process. If the sender and receiver have similar frames of reference, communication will likely be effective. If the sender and receiver have differing frames of reference, the meaning of a message may be distorted. In schools, hierarchical positions, superintendents, principals, teachers, paraprofessionals may have differing frames of reference based on their learning and experiences. Filtering occurs as information is transmitted from one level to another. This can result in distortions of the original meaning. This process is similar to the phenomenon when children play the game telephone. At times, filtering is intentional, such as withholding negative information from a superior or withholding anxiety-producing information from a subordinate. Information overload is an overabundance of information that cannot be processed effectively. This can result from the plethora of communication and information available due to technology. Semantics can be a communication barrier because the same word may have different meanings to different people. Emotion evoking words such as liberal or conservative and professional jargon such as PBIS, RTI, or MTSS can cause misunderstandings. Establishing effective communication is the responsibility of school administrators. Specific communication skills will help overcome barriers to communication. Repetition involves sending the same message multiple times using varying modes such as telephone calls, face-to-face -face discussion, and emails. A school example would be a post-observation conference held between a teacher and a principal as well as a post-observation document with the same information. Empathy is often referred to as walking in someone else's shoes. When communicating, this means a sender attempts to understand the receiver's frame of reference when transmitting a message. Feedback is two-way communication, which increases the likelihood that the message is understood. Written communication is less likely to produce feedback so school administrators are encouraged to use face-to-face -face communication to cultivate and provide feedback. Effective communication requires listening by the sender and receiver. Listening is a skill that must be intentionally practiced and improved. Too often, we listen to respond versus listen to learn and understand.
You've likely heard the saying, the only constant in education is change. There are five forces that typically cause change within schools. The term accountability tends to bring to mind federal school improvement efforts, state standards, and state assessments. There is high accountability for student achievement. Accountability is also found in schools in other forms. For example, teachers are internally accountable to the principal, and likewise, the principal is accountable to the superintendent. Becoming more prevalent are new political pressures, such as open enrollment, homeschooling, charter schools, and vouchers. Enrollment in public schools ex is expanding in ethnic, racial, and linguistic diversity. As this diversity increases, the needs inside public schools become greater. Ethnicity is closely related to poverty and dropout rate. Another source of demographic change is immigration. Many immigrants and their children live in poverty and have limited English proficiency, which increases the need for change within schools. As the number of students enrolled in public education increases, the number of qualified teachers and administrators is diminishing. In addition, the vast majority of educators do not reflect the diversity of their students. This mismatch often results in cultural and social distance between teachers and students and creates a need for change. Advancing technology continues to explode our accessibility to knowledge and data. These technological changes have impacted instructional practices and continue to be an impetus to change within schools. Breakdowns or problems in processes such as inadequate communication, lack of motivation, inappropriate leadership, and poor people performance, high teacher absenteeism, and student dropout rates can also create pressure for change. Most people resist change and perceive change negatively. Change that could lower an income or job status, negatively impacting the employee economically, socially, or in self-esteem is typically resisted. When change occurs, normal routines are disrupted and there is a fear of the unknown. Individuals or groups who have a position of power will resist changes that are felt to reduce their power or influence. In a school setting, this could be seen as a superintendent resisting consolidation with another district. Employees may also resist change that makes their knowledge and skills obsolete. For example, an administrative assistant might resist a computerized attendance program as it may result in a loss of a major job responsibility. The hierarchical structure of schools impedes change. New ideas can be distorted and dropped as they move from top to bottom of the hierarchy. Change requires resources, professional development, time, and personnel. Often districts don't have resources to bring ideas to fruition. Change within school districts could be restricted by collective bargaining agreements and their relationships to salaries, the school calendar, and evaluations. There are strategies that assist in overcoming resistance to change, including those who will be affected by the change to participate in planning, design, and implementation will result in more effective change. A participatory model increases the ideas generated, builds ownership, and reduces unknowns, which stifles rumors and anxieties. Communicating the need for the change and the effect of the change will lessen employees' fear of the unknown. Employees who are informed are more likely to support ideas. Administrative support is necessary to effectively implement change. For example, providing professional development focused on an expected new instructional strategy demonstrates administrative support. Rewards, including salary increases, bonuses, recognition, praise, and status symbols can also help overcome resistance. Well-planned, incremental change can lessen the impact on employees and allow them time to adjust to new expectations and conditions. Coercion can be used to force change. In a school, this might include a position transfer, but the negative effects of coercion should be noted. They include frustration, fear, revenge, dissatisfaction, and turnover. 
Communication is essential to managing complex change within educational systems. Think of a change you recently played a role in. How did communication affect the success of that change? Now that we've dug deeper into communication and change, what might you do differently 